When we think of Margaret Atwood, the first book that we think of is her dystopian novel The Handmaid's Tale, which has sold over 8 million copies and has been turned into an acclaimed TV show. However, Margaret Atwood's other book, another dystopian novel, Oryx and Crake, which she has written around two decades later, deserves just as much examination. In other science fiction narratives, like Star Wars, Dune and Blade Runner, the world is neatly set up and fully explained. Star Wars explains the war raging between the Rebel Alliance and the Empire. Dune explains the conflict over spice on the desert planet of Arrakis. And Blade Runner explains the bounty hunter's search for rogue replicants. In Oryx and Crake, there is no such setup of the world and instead does the exact opposite, withholding details by using terms first and defining them later and disclosing information in an offhand way. Margaret Atwood intentionally leaves out information to create both suspense and story immersion. In Margaret Atwood's first technique, she uses terms first and defines them later. This can be seen especially well for the way she describes animals in the Oryx and Crake universe. In George Orwell's Animal Farm, within the first three pages, he describes every animal that makes an appearance in the novel, such as Boxer, a horse who was an enormous beast nearly 18 hands high and strong as two ordinary horses put together. A white stripe down his nose gave him a somewhat stupid appearance. And in fact, he was not of first-rate intelligence, but he was universally respected for his steadiness of character and tremendous powers of work. On the other hand, whenever a new animal is first introduced in Oryx and Crake, Margaret Atwood leaves out any descriptions. For instance, in Chapter 3, Margaret Atwood writes the Rakunks were a nuisance, scuffling through the leaves and sniffing his toes, nosing around him as if he were already garbage. There is no description of what a Rakunk is, nor what it looks like. All that is known is that it is some sort of animal. The next time Rakunk is brought up is in the next chapter, where Margaret Atwood uses the word four more times, while completely evading any descriptors. It's finally on page 51, where she breaks up the description into three parts, with the first part saying that rakunks are spliced animals, the second part saying that they are black and white and have a fluffy tail, and the last part finally revealing that they come from the best traits of a raccoon and skunk, hence the name rakunk. This delaying of information is also utilised for all the other genetically modified animals in the book, like the pigoon, which was introduced on page 10 and defined on page 22, the bob kitten, which was introduced on page 42 and defined on page 164, and the wolvog, which was introduced on page 10 and defined on page 205. Margaret Atwood creates suspense by withholding descriptors of each animal, allowing readers to guess what they are through context clues. Not only does this create mystery, but also establishes better immersion as it drops the readers into the universe and slowly reveals details instead of dumping it all at once, like how every Star Wars and Blade Runner movie begins with a paragraph of exposition. Rather than having to explain everything all in one section, sci-fi narratives can take inspiration from Oryx and Crake and tastefully disclose world-building information that is integrated into the story rather than unloading huge sections of text exposition. The other tactic that Margaret Atwood uses is disclosing information in an offhand way. In Oryx and Crake, the world is completely destroyed due to climate catastrophe. Rather than revealing it directly, Margaret Atwood chooses to disclose this disaster in very indirect ways. This can be exemplified when she drops details about global destruction in the description of something unrelated, specifically one of the characters gaining admission to an elite college where she writes, He was snatched up at a high price by the Watson Crick Institute. Once a student there and your future was assured. It was like going to Harvard had been back before it was drowned. Through this, it is inferred that if Harvard is underwater, that means that all the other cities along the coastlines are also underwater and destroyed without Margaret Atwood feeding the information to you. Even more subtly, Margaret Atwood points to this bleak reality through the food that the characters in Oryx and Crake eat. 
They eat soyo boy burgers instead of meat, and chocolate soy, mango soy, and roasted dandelion green tea soy instead of ice cream. From this, it can be concluded that the setting of Oryx and Crake is not the same as the current day climate. Basically, food products that are present today, like beef and dairy, are not readily available in this universe, most likely because they are products that come from cows, which are known to be extremely unsustainable. So, they are probably pretty much obsolete in this book. By withholding full descriptions and disclosing it instead in an offhand way, Margaret Atwood is able to let readers fill in the blanks themselves. This helps with immersion, as the focus is placed not on word building, but on plot. Instead of having explanations about how the world came to be dystopian, Margaret Atwood simply drops the reader in immediately and lets them figure it out on their own as the story unfolds. In conclusion, Margaret Atwood withholds information through delaying descriptions of animals in Oryx and Crake, as well as purposely revealing climate catastrophe in a subtle manner. However, these are not all of the instances that Margaret Atwood chooses to withhold information in this novel, but is a technique that is widely used throughout the entirety of the book. By using these techniques, Margaret Atwood not only treats the readers intelligently by letting them connect the dots themselves, but also creates a stronger story overall. When intentionally done, hiding details never subtract from a story, but enhance it. This can be seen particularly well in the comparison of two horror movies, Human Centipede and Psycho, where Human Centipede uses a lot of directly grotesque and graphic imagery, while Psycho uses tastefully concealed gore. In the most iconic scene of the whole film, when Norman Bates murders Marion in the shower, barely any blood is shown. The only on-screen blood is when it is shown going down the drain, which lets the viewers fill in the blanks of the horror themselves. Like this scene from Psycho and Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake, writers across all genres, not just sci-fi and horror, can take inspiration from withholding information and practice the philosophy of less is more.